thanks for the introduction. Um, so one of the uh, most basic principles in <clears throat> quantum mechanics is the so-called well, cloning theorem, where you know that given an unknown quantum state, we cannot create two copies of it. And this very simple principle actually has a lot has led to a lot of applications in quantum crypto, like um, seminal work of Wiesner in '83 that introduced quantum money. And we also have more advanced notions like copy protection and secure leasing or so-called revocable crypto. And in this work, we introduce a new notion based on no cloning um, called like local operations and classical communication or LOCC leakage resilience. Uh, let me start by briefly talking about the previous no cloning based um, notions. For example, in copy protection, we encode a piece of software, a program, a function app into an unclonable quantum state. And we require that no computationally bounded adversary can create two working programs given only this one um, unclonable copy of the program. And like more, I guess, pictorially, we have this challenger that gives Alice this copy protected program and Alice tries to split this into two quantum registers that are entangled and bot venture that received this, but they're not allowed to communicate, but they're entangled mm -hmm. and they will try to mm -hmm. keep using the program. A related and uh, kind of mildly weaker notion is the so-called secure leasing or revocable crypto. In this case, we again encode a program into a unclonable quantum state. And we imagine, for example, like a company uh, leasing out a piece of software for a limited amount of time to some user and at, after their lease term ends, the uh, user needs to return this program to the um, company. And after the successful verification of this returning of the program, Alice shouldn't be able to keep using this program, but the quantum state that it has um, kept with her, which could be possibly entangled with the state that has been returned to the challenger. Before moving on to our new notion of LOCC leakage resilience, let me talk briefly about um, leakage resilient crypto in a classical world. In standard crypto, um, usually the adversary attacks are cryptographic primitive through a very well-defined and strictly um, restricted channel. For example, in a signature scheme, the adversary will get um, signatures for some documents or messages, and it will try to forge a signature for a document that hasn't actually been signed by the authority. Or in public key encryption, the adversary will have the public encryption key and it will try to um, learn the secret communication between two parties by looking at this uh, ciphertext that has been sent back and forth between these two parties and possibly some other related ciphertexts. And it also has a public encryption key. But in all of these models, the adversary actually has no information about the secret keys of the parties, which we assume that the honest parties uh, keep like very secure and the adversary learns nothing about it. This was the standard crypto. And in leakage resilient crypto, we asked the question, what if the adversary actually tries to learn at least a little information, like a partial information about the secret keys also? For example, in the signature setting, the adversary can get um, signatures for various documents. And it also learns some information about the signing key itself. And it tries to forge a signature for a new document. And this is practically very well motivated because uh, researchers and the more practical side of things have shown that there are various ways of learning partial information about the secret key. For example, you could analyze the electromagnetic radiation emitted by the computers of honest parties that they're doing some computation that involve their secret key. You could do the same using some thermal imaging, or you could even just uh, monitor their uh, computer's power usage like power profile, or you, you could even just um, observe the sounds emitted by their computers during computations involving their secret key. And um, all of these attacks have been shown to break uh, very well-known cryptographic schemes that are actually secure and the uh, restricted model where you learn nothing about the secret key. But as soon as you learn even some little information through, through side channels like this, the schemes are completely broken. So before defining leakage resilient crypto formally, let me quickly introduce um, public key encryption for people who are not familiar. In public key encryption, we have a public key that lets you encrypt messages, and we have a secret key that lets you decrypt ciphertexts, and we require some basic correctness where you can 
correctly decrypt ciphertexts. And our security notion says that given only the public key to the adversary and a ciphertext encrypting some known message M0 or M1, the adversary should not be able to distinguish these ciphertexts. An equivalent notion is this so-called game-based notion where the adversary gets the public key and it chooses some messages M0, M1, and it gets the encryption of a random one M sub, M sub B, and it tries to guess this output, uh, this hidden bit B, and it shouldn't be able to do better than random guessing, which is a probability one over two correct, and so we require one over two plus negligible. And if a weaker notion of security for PKE is the so-called unpredictable security, where we require that the adversary, again, gets the public key and gets the ciphertext this time of a random message, and it shouldn't be able to completely recover the encrypted message. But this is somewhat less meaningful than the previous notion where we require that you like almost learn no information at all about the message given the ciphertext. In this case, you could learn some parts of the message actually, um, and that doesn't necessarily violate the security. Right, so in the leakage resilience, we kind of have a similar game where the adversary again gets the public key, but this time it also gets this function, let's call it a leak of the secret key, let's call it the output L, and the adversary gets the ciphertext and also this leakage, and it again tries to guess this hidden bit and it shouldn't be able to do better than random guessing. So here we actually didn't specify what this leakage function is, and uh, we need to kind of impose some restriction here because we cannot just let it be any function. In this case, we could, and you could just output the secret key itself. Previous verbs have made this more concrete by various choices. For example, there is this whole line of research on bond of leakage where we require that the leakage function has a bond of output length. For example, it could be like 10% of the secret key length. Or we also have this no easy leakage notion where we require that the leakage that you learn doesn't drop the min entropy of the secret key by too much. And this is kind of modeling the case where there's some noise on the leakage that you obtain. Given the practical attacks, these are uh, somewhat just justifiable, but um, they're kind of still artificial and you cannot know if they actually capture all possible leakage attacks. And the main reason we impose actually this, these restrictions are because, as I said, if you don't impose any restric restrictions on the leakage function, then you could just output the secret key itself and there's no security. In this work, we introduced this um, new notion of LOCC leakage resilience, which is only possible using quantum computation. In this case, we consider the secret key as a quantum state and the adversary, the leakage adversary gets to measure this quantum state key arbitrarily and adaptively for any number of rounds, and there is no restrictions on the output length of the measurements either. And our justification for this model is that, as we just saw, like all known um, leakage attacks have been some kind of measurement on the computers of the honest parties that store the secret keys. But this single definition actually captures all of the known uh, leakage attacks so far. Right, so more formally, again, we have this challenger that is the quantum secret key and the adversary gets to specify some measurement circuit and it gets the leak uh, measurement result and it again, adaptively specifies standard measurement circuit and gets the measurement outcome and so on for any number of rounds or any polynomial number of rounds that's not a very fixed. And at the end of this leakage phase, it again gets the encryption of some M sub B so or some random B tries to learn the certain bit B, and we require that even given this huge amount of leakage, it shouldn't be able to do better than random guessing. So obviously this is classically impossible because when just with one round, if there's no restriction on the output length of the measurement, you can just output the whole secret key. As I said, formally we have this multiple rounds of leakage and at the end of the leakage phase, you get the encryption of M sub B and you're trying to guess this bit B. So the questions we ask, uh, in this work is, can we actually design cryptographic schemes that actually resist such a strong notion of leakage tax? And another question that we're asking is, as we talked at the beginning, um, there are other notions of 
no cloning based crypto like clonable or copy protection crypto or like revocable or secure leasing crypto. And is there a connection between this new notion of LOCC leakage resilience and these other no cloning based notions? And finally, can we even provide security guarantees even stronger than LOCC leakage resilience? In this work, we show that assuming distinguishability, obfuscation, and LWE, or those who are not familiar, these are, uh, I guess, kind of strong but somewhat common cryptographic assumptions. Assuming these cryptographic assumptions, we can actually construct public key encryption schemes that resist LOCC leakage, leakage attacks. And assuming the existence of an object called quantum lightning, relatively a classic oracle, we can actually also um, construct a quantum money scheme where the adversary gets some banknotes. And on top of that, it also gets some kind of a low CC leakage on the secret key of the bank itself. And it sh still shouldn't be able to produce an extra banknote. And these are the feasibility results. In terms of connections to the previous notions, we actually show that in the most basic setting, this new notion of uh, LCC leakage resilience is actually implied by copy protection. Namely, in the unpredictable uh, security setting, um, copy protection does imply non-adaptive, just like a single round non-adaptive leakage resilience, again, in the unpredictability setting. Um, but we show that this implication is, actually doesn't go any further than this. Relatively a quantum oracle, we show that there exists a PKE scheme that, that, that does satisfy copy protection, but it doesn't satisfy even a single round of adaptive leakage resilience. And we also have some similar results on um, different cryptographic notions like signature schemes and uh, um, pseudo-random function keys. And finally, we also introduce, again, another new notion, unique quantum notion called intrusion detection where we assume that the adversary is not trying to obtain some kind of side information on our secret key. It has actually completely broken into our computer. And it, in this case, it can just steal our secret key, actually. But we show that if you are using a quantum secret key, we can at least detect if something like this has happened. And this is, again, impossible classically, because classically information, you can just steal or copy someone's classical key without being that detected at all. And we show that this new notion is equivalent to um, publicly verifiable secure leasing, another no cloning based notion we talked about at the beginning. And in particular, based on previous work, uh, this gives us intrusion detection uh, constructions for various crypto primitives, assuming against some cryptographic assumptions. But before moving on to like, connections to previous notions, let me more formally define the previous no cloning based um, notions. So in copy protecting, as we said, there is some kind of functionality encoded into a quantum state that we're trying to clone as the adversary, and we shouldn't be able to do so. More formally, in the case of um, public key encryption in the so-called CPA setting, uh, we will have this adversary that gets this secret quantum key and tries to split this into two quantum entangled registers. And after the splitting, these adversaries, Bob and Charlie, are not communicating because if they could communicate, they could just ask each other to decrypt things. And after the split, they get these uh, random challenges, encryptions of random uh, B, and they're trying to guess simultaneously the hidden bits, hidden challenge bits, B uh, sub B and B sub C. So here we require that they cannot do so simultaneously with probability better than one over two plus negligible. So here the baseline security is actually one over two because what Alice can do is she can just give her key to Bob who can decrypt correctly and Charlie can just randomly guess its challenge. So the baseline is one over two. We also have the unpredictability setting similar to classical PK. Again, Alice puts her quantum key and this time, um, Bob and Charlie get encryptions of random long messages, and they're trying to guess the message in full. Again, this is kind of weaker than the CPA version because they could possibly learn some parts of the message. But in terms of the relationship of our new notion of LCC leakage resilience to previous notions, 
naively, it might look like it should be implied by copy protection. After all, uh, measurement outcome is classical. So the leakage information is classical, so, which can be copied. What we can do is in the copy protection experiment, we can just pretend or simulate um, the leakage adversary and whatever leakage we obtain, we could just clone it with, since it is just classical. And this should probably break the copy protection, which means that copy protection should imply leakage resilience. So this does work in the very simple setting of unpredictable copy protection implies unpredictable, non-adaptive, like just a single round of leakage. Basically, we're doing the reduction I just described. Suppose you can break the leakage resilient experiments, experiment with some immersed yeah. polynomial probability. In the copy protection experiment, you just simulate this leakage, get the <clears throat> classical leakage outcome, and you just copy it and give it to Bob and Charlie. And by some like Jensen's and Equality argument, we can show that even though we have like two adversaries that are trying to win in this case, as opposed to just a single adversary in the LOCC case, this is just gonna be like an inverse polynomial still. So this does break unpredictable copy protection, which gives us this implication. But this does work in the most simple setting, but what about CPA style security, where we're trying to guess like you're trying to learn any information at all about the uh, messages. As I said, in the unpredictability setting, like there is no um, guarantee that prevents us from learning parts of the message. In CPA slash security, we know that you have no information at all about the message encrypted. And also this was just like one round of non-adaptive leakage where the um, measurement circuit itself is part of the adversary algorithm description. It doesn't depend on the, um, public key at all. It could get public key as the input, but it's not specified by the adversary as a um, thing that depends on the public key. And we just have like one round of leakage. What about like more rounds of leakage? In the original definition, we defined it as having any polynomial rounds of adaptive measurements. So going beyond the very simple setting, we have actually two challenges. So the first challenge is that as we just described in the Leakage resilience setting, we actually have one adversary that tries to win the um, security game. Because in the copy protection setting, we have two adversaries that are simultaneously trying to um, learn the messages that are encrypted. And a related challenge is that um, the leakage resilience adversary actually accumulates some kind of internal quantum state throughout this leakage experiment. So it adaptively um, specify some measurement circuits for multiple rounds. And it could also do some kind of quantum computation locally that depends on both the leakage measurement that it has specified and the leakage outcome that it has obtained. And we cannot simply copy this state to create like two adversaries for the copy protection experiment because again, the adversary's internal state is also quantum. For example, in terms of challenge one, uh, let me try to do the same simple reduction from copy protection to leakage resilience. Suppose you can break the leakage resilience with some probably like one over two plus one over poly. In the copy protection experiment, you can just simulate leakage and copy the leakage outcome. But in this case, you will have two adversaries. Again, they win, but probably like kind of squared of the leakage resilience adversary winning on its own. In this case, it's going to be like one over four plus one over poly. But this is like much lower than even the baseline attack of just giving the secret key one of, to one of the adversaries and the other adversary randomly guessing this challenge. So this doesn't work at all. Second challenge is that, as I said, throughout the leakage experiment, the adversary uh, maintains and accumulates some kind of quantum state on its side that depends on the leakage outcomes and the leakage choices that it has made. And to copy to break copy protection in the reduction, from the leakage resilience experiment, we will actually need to create two adversaries that win simultaneously. And we know that the leakage resilience adversary only wins if it uses this particular state that it has accumulated over the protocol. And we won't be able to clone this quantum state. But it affects even on predictability security, which is like the weaker notion. As soon as we go up to like adaptive notion of even one round of leakage and for more rounds like two or any polynomial round, round of numbers, we have no hope. 
So we actually show that this is not a weakness of our proof techniques because we've been just talking about a particular way of reducing copy protection to leakage resilience. There could be other ways that we cannot see immediately. But this is actually not a weakness of our proof techniques, but there exists a quantum oracle relative to which there exists a PEK scheme that does satisfy copy protection, but it doesn't satisfy even a single round of adaptive leakage. So in general, leakage resilience is not weaker than copy protection. But before moving on to um, these impossibility results of implication, let me talk a briefly about um, our feasibility results. So we do have a um, public key encryption scheme that satisfies leakage resilience, LOCC leakage resilience, based on indistinguishability obfuscation and the uh, learning with errors assumption. So let me talk about our construction. So we will use the um, so-called coset states, which consists of uh, in supposition, all the elements of some coset that is of dimension lambda over two, where we have this random subspace and we have this random shift to get a coset. And we also have this um, random inner product phase here for some random element S prime. And this coset state satisfies this nice property that when you apply QFD, you get the um, orthogonal coset or coset for the orthogonal subspace. And more importantly, this um, process states satisfy a very strong notion of uh, security called monogamy of entanglement, where it's kind of similar to the copy protection experiments. The challenger prepares some a copy, sorry, uh, process state, and it gives the Alice. And Alice tries to split this uh, process state into two parts that are possibly entangled between Bob and Charlie. And Bob and Charlie even get to learn actually the subspace itself later on, like the classical description of the subspace. And they're trying to output some vector in both the primal subspace and the orthogonal subspace. And we require that they cannot do that with probability better than sub-exponentially small in the size of the subspace. We also have like a... Um, random challenge version of this. This was implicit in some previous work. We formalize it in our work. In this case, the adversary prepares like multiple coset states. And again, I'll try to split them into two adversaries. And these adversaries later on also learn the actual subspace descriptions classically. And they also get some kind of random challenge telling them to output a vector either in the actual subspace or the orthogonal subspace and they're trying to output such vectors, and they shouldn't be, and be sure that they're not able to do so with, a, with probability better than some exponentially small in the size of the uh, process state. So actually, uh, process states have been really useful in designing copy protection schemes, but they're not directly helpful in designing leakage resilience schemes because there's like no notion of leakage or anything here. This is like very close to the copy protection experiment where you're trying to split some kind of um, um, state. So we show a new property for coset states called uh, LOCC leakage resilience for coset states. In this setting, uh, again, the challenger prepares some coset states and gives them to Alice. And Bob specifies um, adaptively multiple rounds of measurements that will be applied to the coset states, and it applies, and it learns the leakage outcomes. And similar to the leakage resilience setting, after learning all these leakage outcomes, Bob also learns some kind of random challenge and actually subspace descriptions also. And it shouldn't be able to output vectors in the correct subspace, like the primal one or the orthogonal one, with probability better than some exponential, given all this leakage information on the coset states. So the proof idea for this new property for coset states is as follows. So as we said, one of the challenges in obtaining some kind of leakage resilience from copy protection type of security is that we will not be able to clone the leakage resilience adversary state and the reduction to the copy protection game. But luckily, in this case, we are in the information theoretic setting. So at least we can try to clone the leakage resilience adversary state in exponential time. 
but we still need to be careful because even though we're we have like a bound amount of time, we still have a single copy of the state that we're trying to leak on. So for example, if we could if we are trying to naively clone the adversary's state by just running it in parallel twice, they're very likely to specify different measurement circuits each round. And we just get to apply our leakage measurement once each round because we have like a single copy of the state that we're trying to leak on. But we can actually resolve this using the following idea. So we start with a very high number of um, copies of the adversary's initial advice that doesn't depend on like the public key or anything. We will de determine this high number later on. And during each run, we actually run the uh, separate copies of the adversary multiple times until we get like two copies or um, to make this for multiple rounds, we will need to obtain like multiple copies. We just keep running the separate copies of the adversary until we get the same leakage measurement choice. And when we get the same leakage measurement choice, actually we can just apply it once and we can use the classical leakage outcome multiple times because it's classical, we can just copy it. What we do is, as I said, during each round, we use like a lot of copies from previous rounds, like inductively assume that we have enough copies from the previous rounds of leakage. And we repeatedly run our adversary. We're probably destroying most of the states that we got from the previous rounds. But at the end, we will try to obtain sufficiently number of copies of adversarial state for this uh, next round of leakage. As I said, when we uh, obtain the same choice of leakage circuit, we can actually just leak once and uh, use it to create multiple copies of the adversary state that are conditioned on that same leakage choice for the next round. So there's still kind of a problem here because some leakage circuit choices might be like really hard to obtain. Even though you get to have exponential time, we still need to bound the total amount of time that we're using. But we show that this is actually not a problem in average because if some leakage circuit choice is really uh, rare, then it's also not gonna appear in an average for any single copy at all. So we actually show that given some like A copies of the adversarial state from the previous round and a fixed choice of leakage circuit, we can actually produce um, B extra copies of the state of the leakage adversary for the next round that are indeed conditioned on the same leakage circuit choice for any um, D with probability, I guess this, average over the choice of leakage circuit. I guess this is like a long way of saying that we can still bound the num amount of time that we uh, spend on this experiment, but we, at the end, we are able to actually produce two copies of the final internal state of the leakage adversary, which we can use in the copy protection experiment. And since we are in, in a like a negligible security regime here, and the squaring issue doesn't appear here, like you don't have an issue of one over two versus one over four here. So using this leakage resilience property for coset states, um, we can design a leakage resilient public key encryption in the natural way where we will have some kind of program as our safe protects that actually verifies your coset state um, in some sense, in the sense of like the leakage resilience challenge. For example, the ciphertext will have a random challenge embedded inside it. And it will also have it, some programs verifying the vectors in the primal or the orthogonal subspace. And our uh, ciphertext program gets as input the um, vectors that depend on this challenge that will also be given to the adversary. And upon successful verification of these vectors, which just basically emulate the challenger of the leakage resilience experiment for the asset states, if they are successfully verified, it just releases the hidden message. So I think it's kind of natural to see how it how this relates to the leakage resilience property for coset states. Uh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So basically, uh, this kind of naturally reduces to the leakage re resilience property for coset states, at least in the black box. Oracle model for the ciphertext programs. 
you need to do some more work for the cryptographic version where we assume distinguishability obfuscation instead of a black box obfuscation. And I guess how much time? Oh, okay. I guess we don't have. Okay. Yeah, as I said, one of our other results is that uh, copy protection doesn't imply even one round of adaptive leakage. And to show that, you rely on so-called quantum lightning states where anyone can create a unclonable state, but even if they get to create their own state, they're not actually able to create two copies of the same state. And we crucially rely on the leakage adversary creating such a state uh, on its side and in the reduction, we won't be able to provably we won't be able to copy the state to create a copy protection adversary. And this gives us a separation between copy protection and one round leakage results. That's it. A very basic question about the uh, general setup. Um, so my impression is like the, the, the model is that, uh, so, so, so in the sense of how to, the, the app motivation in the sense of an application, like you said there's, for example, a program. So the program provider has uh, the program encoded in, in some state it gives to the, to the user. And then the user after some time gives back the state to make sure and the provider can then check is the state still the same in order to make sure that the program was not cloned or copied or whatever. Yeah, you're talking about the security setting. Exactly, yeah, yeah. And like realistically speaking, I mean, pretty surely the, the or at least, I, I find it very, very, um, what I find in interesting is that there could happen all sorts of things for disturbing the state without it being copying. Like that, I don't know, there is some very strong sun ray hitting the lap of uh, the user and perturbing the state in one way or another. And there is no way of distinguishing between the case there's something else that perturbed the state or it is perturbed because of copying. Um, is there any trend in the field of trying to figure out means of distinguishing these two cases? Uh, so you're talking about an honest person, but their copy of the software somewhat gets damaged. Exactly, yeah. That's a good question. I don't think there's any proof like that. And it might be impossible to do that. I'm not sure. 